Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for Fortress Pre-Close webcast. We're not going to take too much of your time, given it's December, so straight over to Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Ridwan, and thanks, uh, Shane and the team from Nedbank for, for hosting us again. It's the third time. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Fortress Pre-Close call from a very gloomy, wet, cold Johannesburg with a lot of load shedding going on. I guess uh, everybody's keen on uh, running off on holiday, so we'll make this uh, quite short. Um, that's just the agenda for this afternoon. We'll just start with uh, an overview that I think many of you would have seen if you had attended our uh, year-end results presentation. So on your screen, you should be able to see just uh, what we presented at the 30th of June, which is really just our, our asset mix, our, our NAV and our loan to value. Um, and as we've, as we've stated there, we were you know, tar targeting the sale of those non-core assets, which total around about 10 billion rand. So it's the SA direct industrial of about four, our direct offices of about three, a little bit less than that now. Um, the just over 10 percent holding we've got in resilient REITs. That was the year end number. It's a little bit higher than that at about 2.7 billion now. And then other, which is a property, it's our residential hotel and some other assets at uh, 500 million. So that 10 billion really we're looking to, to dispose of. And uh, as we said, we're not, uh, not for sellers of any of that. So we are looking to dispose of it at uh, what we consider fair values and rotate that really into our development pipeline of our direct logistics assets. And if you look on the right there, we've just tried to give everyone some color on you know, how we see that rolling out. Um, we've got our direct uh, SA logistics at 30th of June of around 3 billion Rand on the left-hand side there. And we've got about 5 billion Rand of incremental CapEx to roll out our, our pipeline. So that'll take the SA direct logistics to circa 17 and a half billion. Our retail um, staying static at about 10. We've just used uh, you know, constant uh, numbers there from the 30th of June. Nepi Rock Castle are uh, just under 24% of that at 18, roughly 18 billion. And then that'll give us um, circa 5 billion of cash uh, with an LTV target of 30%. We will pay down a little bit of debt and then have 4 billion to uh, look for new opportunities or strategic acquisitions. Um, in terms of the focus going forward for the medium term, obviously it's our asset disposals, as we said. Uh, year to date, we've done 308 million. We've uh, sold and transferred out the door. Quite a lot of that was held for sale at year end. And probably disposals which we've signed, but have as yet not transferred, but are highly likely to, 565 uh, will give you some more color on that later on in the presentation. And using that cash to really write out our development pipeline. So total GLA estimate on our pipeline is about 900,000 square meters at the moment. Obviously it changes depending on what we do on each site. Um, that's not our pro rata share, that's really the share that is, is the control of Fortress and is at the moment, if you see in the middle there, bullet point number three, our estimated yield 8.4% on what we've currently commenced construction on, and that's 8.4, all in including our, our capitalized interest. Um, if we look then at our core portfolio performance, uh, obviously our biggest asset being the strategic stake that we've got in Nippy Rock Castle, they reported strong results and revised guidance up, just based on a slightly delayed sale of their office, office portfolio, so that was, that was quite pleasing, and I think uh, a lot of solid market demand there also from their script take up. I think it was 50 to 60%, which was pleasing. Um, the core portfolios we think remain quite strong in the current market conditions, which are, as I'm sure you will have heard from many of the other listed REITs, very soft at the moment. Our direct logistics portfolio, obviously we've got the um, development pipeline, which is being converted into income producing properties and that's still carrying on very well. Um, a couple of key lettings that we've had during the period. Uh, we had a few vacancies in Cape Town at our Montague Business Park, which we own 25% of. So we've got an extension there for take a lot. Um, obviously, need a lot of space for all the stuff that's getting ordered online for Christmas. Uh, Bounty Brands has also uh, taken a bit more space. And then in Epping, we had um, a vacancy there. It was the still actually moving out, but we've managed to relet that one. Um, fortunately, prior to the tenant vacating, so that was also quite pleasing. 
Um, all of that led to a slight reduction in the vacancy from 4% to 3.5% as at the end of September um, due to the, the lettings there at Montague. Our budget, we slightly ahead of budget, but uh, performance for the year, we still expect to be in line with our, our budget for the full financial year. This is a slide that we've, we've introduced just to really give, uh, give the market a little bit of color on what we're targeting in terms of our development rollout. So we've just got the years there, and please bear in mind that this is a target. Um, you know, that's really what we would like to do. Uh, if the market is softer, it, it may take longer. And I think from my experience, having held Montague and M1 Business Park for a long time, there are often little pockets that, that remain undeveloped for you know, for a number of years. So that's really what we're targeting, circa the 200,000 square meters per year. We think that's what the market can can take up. And I think, you know, just a high level comment on this, we're still seeing construction costs flat. Uh, so we're getting very, very attractive construction cost rates. So we, we still are managing, I think, to offer rentals for new space that is below the current rentals that tenants are paying for paying for a second-hand space. And if you look at the cost per square meter that we are able to develop new space at, still um, competitive and below where we see market transactions for second-hand logistics space. Um, so what we've got there is in the light blue, if you look at the 2020 calendar year, sorry, that's calendar years, not financial years. Um, the light blue is what we've currently spent. And the dark blue is our, our incremental CAPEX, including uh, capitalized interest. So, you know, and I think that's really been our, our, our story that we've tried to communicate is it's roughly a billion rand a year that we need in terms of cash to roll out the pipeline. And that's gonna come from the, from the asset sales. So if you take all of the incremental costs that gets you to circa the 5 billion that we mentioned at the beginning in our overview, and the historic costs are around 2.6 billion, we've uh, got, a few other land pockets we've, which we've excluded from this. It's really just small, small pieces of land at Montague, um, Union Park and Linbro that we are that, that we haven't included in this because those should be developed uh, in the next couple of months and they're quite small pockets. Um, what we've done here, just in terms of the incremental cost is we've assumed a 3% per annum building cost inflation over the period. Um, we chatted to our quantity surveyors, they think that's too much. They, they aren't expecting anything, but I think uh, because it's been flat for a while, I think there, there may be some, some increases in, in some of the input costs, but uh, I think 3% is quite conservative. And uh, you know, when we put that with the 3% rental growth, we're getting circa 8, 8.5% eight uh, all-in yield on, on these with 3% uh, rental growth from, from market at today. Um, so I think it's, it's quite... Uh, it's quite a good pipeline that we've got. And I think, you know, increasingly what, we've, what we're seeing is, is guys really want to be inside a park. Even tenants who don't get any benefit from being inside a park, um, just they really uh, prefer to be, to be in there in terms of the security, the access to power. Um, you know, it's a nice environment for the office tenants. So we've had quite a few guys actually approach us where they are looking to do standalone developments that they have to own. Um, but they enter into negotiations to actually try and buy a portion of the industrial park from us. And that's something that we, we're happy to entertain as long as it's a significantly above our cost. And I think it also, we've got, to, we've got quite a big pipeline. So we're happy to, to explore selling it, provided we can you know, really control exactly what they are building and what they're doing inside our industrial parks. This is what we push the button on in terms of uh, construction at the moment, as you'll see, most of that is towards the back end of calendar year 2020. Um, our pro rata share is 1.7 billion, and we're expecting to, that to come online at an 8.3% uh, percent yield. I think all of those are, are, are getting a lot of interest from potential tenants. Um, we've had you know, quite a lot of interest at Clearwood, and hopefully we'll sign a lease on half of that uh, 49,000. It's really one, one sort of pocket but two boxes on half of that space quite shortly. Um, Eastport Logistics Park Building 3, that's a, a pre-let deal and we've had quite a lot of interest in Long Lake which is uh, really that old Zendai land um, sort of at the back of at the back of Lindbro Park. To touch on the retail portfolio, I think also 
pleasing performance there in terms of like for like sales growth of plus four percent it's uh, certainly significantly above where we see a lot of the retailers are uh, coming out on on their like for like sales so I think it indicates that we've got a lot of the better trading stores in our portfolio um, it was also a strong spot there for white river crossing I'll see the picture on the right hand side that opened in in August this year and I think Checkers, Fresh X, and Woolworths, and just came on trading very, very well there. Um, reversions, we've had flat to marginally positive on lease renewals, which I think again is, is positive and means that our portfolio is uh, fairly rented and, and at market. Black Friday, once again, was a successful campaign. I think it, it remains to be seen whether it is a net benefit or whether we're just stealing trade that would have happened in December anyway. I think. I think that's that is starting to happen. I don't know if it's a net big positive for the for the retailers. But certainly, the feedback we've had is that it does grow a lot of revenue and top line, but uh, that the guys, you know, on a net profit basis, aren't uh, they? They aren't loving it, but I think they feel they have to compete. Our Edcon exposure has been reduced to our targeted 18,000 square meters. Um, you'll see that just a couple of points below there that led to an increase in our vacancies of about. 1.5, 1.6% as Edgar's left uh, what we used to call Edgar's West Street in Durban, but it's now we've had to rename it to 409 West. You know, just that last point under general in terms of grocers, we've really seen in our portfolio grocers doing very, very well. Other than athleisure, we've we've seen uh, the fashion not doing as well, and I think that also does indicate, you know, um, in terms of our portfolio, we have a lot more grocery sort of anchored. Um, centers rather than the big dominant retail malls which tend to rely more on fashion. Pharmaceuticals really led by led by an outstanding performance from clicks. It's also led the way and I think that is speaks to the state of the SA consumer in terms of really just going for um, the necessities in terms of uh, groceries and pharmaceuticals. Ath Leisure just you know really is uh, taking over and that's I think led by the likes of sports scene Again, similar to the logistics portfolio, it's marginally ahead of budget for 2019. And I think if we look forward, um, we're expecting it to be more or less in line with what we budgeted uh, when we gave guidance to the market at our junior end results. The offices, um, I think we've had quite a lot of good progress in terms of lettings there. Uh, we signed a new 10-year lease with Netgear at Monietla Office Park, which is next to the Sunningham Hospital. It's been uh, I think it's taken us more than 10 years to negotiate that 10-year lease, but finally it's been done. Um, and also Vox Telecom's renewed at Rutherford Estate uh, opposite <coughs> Norose Arch on 8,800 square meters for another four years, marginally ahead of our budgeted rental, funnily enough. So all of that has actually reduced our vacancies down to 18.1%. And we have another sale in the pipeline of a vacant building in Parktown, which uh, we're hoping to get through this year or early next year, and it's looking quite positive. A couple more conditions to meet there. If we get that across the line, it should hopefully reduce down to around about 15%. Just an update there on our Sampton site opposite the half train. Still a fantastic site, so we do have a lot of interest, and we actually met, uh, met a potential user today who, who would take about half of that site. So we hopefully will sign a heads of terms in the next day or so. So I think we're still seeing some some reasonably good interest on that and are, are cautiously optimistic that we will we will get out of that one. Yet today performance is also slightly ahead of budget. Um, we've had some, as I mentioned, the lease at Monietla as well as um, SureSwipe moving into Wedgwood, which uh, I think was a, a great lease. So I think that one also, again, year to date performance a bit ahead of budget, but if we look forward, just given what we're seeing in the market and the load shedding and the general doom and gloom, I think we're expecting that to be um, around about what we budgeted for the full financial year. Our direct industrial portfolio, as we mentioned, I think earlier this year, what we saw in March with um, that load shedding was that really this is where it has the biggest impact on our on our tenants, um, the big power users. So although we marginally had a budget on this portfolio, I think, you know, if we continue down this road of stage four, stage six, four, you know, certainly into January and February, we, we may see this uh, portfolio soften and might uh, uh, rise, in, uh, rise in vacancies led by really tenants that just can't afford to pay the rentals and, and just can't cope in this current situation. Um, again, we just have 
really focused on the marketing of these buildings. I don't think uh, this portfolio is particularly bad, and a lot of the smaller users are are still performing quite well in terms of their business, but it's just really focusing on the tenant relationships and getting the buildings just to a state that we can let them easily and uh, you know that also leads to the increased enthusiasm on the sales side so that's really just our focus is putting a bit of lipstick on these buildings and sending them to the door um, a couple of lettings there that have been quite positive 154 Montero Road has been a sticky vacancy for a while so we've let that um, vacancy to the current tenant um, Setchell Road in Riddercorp, also Imperial, I was looking, looking to take some ex ex extra space there, which is very positive. And uh, we got Ballora to sign a six-year lease in uh, Jet Park at 11 Cavora Road. But we still saw an increase in the vacancies there. Um, we had a big vacancy where Savino Del Bene moved out of. They moved to our eSports site for a new 24,000 square meter development and uh, moved out of Jet Park. And we stuck with a vacancy there. but. We've got quite a lot of interest in that facility, so hopefully we'll we'll close a deal there in the next month or so. Again, slightly ahead of our budget, but uh, I think we are expecting it to be in line for the full financial year. That's just a summary of our vacancies. Pretty static. Um, the the most recent vacancy at 7.1 percent, marginally better than the one at June. As you can see in the middle there, the retail has jumped up from 4 to 5.9. This is still based on GLA. Um, that's led by the 10,500 squares that Ed has left at 409 West Street. But if we look at the value per square, it's sub 10,000 rand a square meter, so it's still pretty low. Um, pleasing performance there for, for logistics and, uh, and also office. The other is so small that we really don't focus on that much. Property disposals here to date, we've done the 300 million. Um, as you can see there, a few of them were held for sale at year end other than Tiger Moth and Wentworth Four Ways, which was sold on auction. Um, so that was a, a pleasing performance. 564 million is under offer. Um, I think the most notable ones, which we've had held for sale for a while, are um, WAG and We Buy Cars. We've had quite a few issues there engaging with council in terms of just getting that subdivision through. I think we've had to relay the sewer pipe seven times or something like that. So, you know, when they when they focus, they can do their job really well. So we, we hopefully will get those transferred in the next couple of months. Um, so if we look for the full financial year, as it stands today, we're highly likely to do 872 million without concluding any further sales for the next six months. But we have got um, one tenant to exercise an option to purchase a building for around about 155 million and two other portfolio deals. Um, those portfolio deals, 560 million and about 1.1 billion. It's the most positive we've been on a, on portfolio deals to date. So we are cautiously optimistic, having not closed one for a number of years. Um, but if we look forward in terms of our sales pipeline, we're sitting at around about 1.96 billion, excluding what you see on your screen. And that's roughly at an average yield of 9%. So even in this market, we're still managing to find quite a few sophisticated buyers who are sending us signed offers and you've got the cash at at or about our, our existing book values. So I think that does give us a lot of confidence in the uh, in the book values of our properties. Just to touch on liquidity and funding, um, currently available facilities, we've got 2.7 billion undrawn. Uh, we did repay just an expiring note of 438 million, which expired in September and we issued a five-year bond under our DMTN program at I think pricing to relatively attractive, not as attractive as I think we would like it just yet, but three months Java plus 185. Um, I've got Ian sitting next to me. How many, what have we got in terms of total bonds issued for the year? About 800? <clears throat> 1.3 billion. 1 billion. Okay, so I think it's, you know, if we look back 18 months, it's very positive. I mean, we've been managed to issue 1.3 billion to the DMT in market. Yes, a lot of that was refinances, but I think it's very positive that that market is is open and still able to uh, price these bonds attractively and certainly very attractively compared to the senior secured bank debt that we see. In terms of the hedges, we've had no material changes. Our cross currency swap still around about the 41% in terms of our total net fee exposure. Um, and we haven't done any material swaps or caps 
in addition to what we reported at the June hearing. In terms of our financial performance effect, really what we've just tried to do here is uh, just give you a little bit of a, a robot in terms of red and green. So net rental income, we slightly positive to our budget. Um, income from equity investments, as we mentioned, that NEPI um, burden, so that's also slightly positive. Operating expenses and other distributable income, slightly down in terms of uh, income that we get on you know, the staff loan and some other OPEX amounts, but it's really not material about material amounts. Net finance costs also slightly up. We've had uh, slightly less cash outflows, so we've, we've sat on cash and uh, got relatively attractive rates from the DMTN market. So all of that leads to income available for distribution at slightly above where we were, where we were forecasting at the junior end. Um, I think we, we need to just also touch on a, a little bit of sensitivity here. So we've got a, a slide entitled Capital Structure and Distribution Guidance. And uh, really what, we've, what we're saying here is, I think it's, a, it's almost a tale of two parts for Fortress at the moment. The underlying business is performing, I think, relatively well in this current market. The assets are quite strong. I think the team is settled, the operations are good. Uh, the sales are the most positive we've seen in a while and we're able to refinance bank debt easily and uh, raise notes in the DMTN market. So the underlying core business is, is actually performing quite well. We do have a unique capital structure that I think in a low growth environment does uh, lead to the higher risk Fortress B is taking a bit of pain and the uh, Fortress A is, you know, sitting there at 19 Rand, 50, 20 Rand, at, you know, smiling at the moment. I think, you know, it's, a, it's been a great, a great year in terms of share price performance for them. So if we split that on the slide in terms of the underlying performance, I think when we look at our distributable earnings per share, we previously guided 148 to 153 cents per B. We're expecting that to be roughly 150, 152 cents. So slightly towards the upper end of the range on a consistent distribution methodology basis. And we please do draw your attention to the, uh, to the assumptions that we use on page 15 of the, of the pack. And then the FFA share to increase by the lower of CPR of 5%. CPR is looking like it's gonna average uh, about a percent less than that. So, so that might come down from the 155.8 cents. But as I mentioned, we've seen a quite a reduction in the price of the B shares. I think it's also a combination of what's happened to other REITs A and B structures, of which ours is is really a, an outlier in terms of the performance that we've got in the size of Fortress and the gearing and the asset quality. So I think it's a, it's it's not really comparable to the other shares with a similar structure in the market. That being said, I think we we're very sensitive to the reduction in the share price of of the B shares at the moment, and we also acutely aware that the risk capital for our business is really provided by the FFB shareholders. And, you know, as a management team and as a board, we have prioritized trying to build and maintain confidence in the value of the Bs over the long term. If we don't have the ability over the long term to attract the Fortress B share capital, it does create significant difficulties for our business if we want to grow going forward. So we are, really focused on evaluating a number of options with our advisors and you know as a as a good corporate citizen really need to focus on getting fair and equitable returns for all of our capital providers the a's the b's the banks the dmtn market and i think that'll lead to a stable company over the long term given the challenges that we face in the current market we also uh, want to maintain a strong and liquid balance sheet i think with load shedding and what's going on in the country and the, the the very soft macro environment, you know, the board has considered and is considering the introduction of a dividend payout ratio. They have made no decision in regard to this as yet. Um, but we will consult all of our advisors and uh, the board will provide the market and the stakeholders feedback when we release our interim results, which is on the 5th of March, 2020. Um, just some other Feedback, I think that we have we had some board changes recently, so we welcome Ina Lopia, and she was uh, previously on the Bukilia board, managing director of the SA Operations, deep property experience, um, and we also bid farewell with a, a great deal of gratitude to Barnes van der Volt for his contribution to capital and, and subsequently Fortress, 
and some changes in the chairs of the subcommittees. Jan Porthita will chair the investment committee. Robin Lockhart Ross is now going to chair the audit committee, and Sue Ludolf now chairs the uh, the risk committee. That's it from me. We can take some questions now. Let me just kick off. So, Stephen, you're announcing the potential dividend payout. Just your your, your reasoning, or thinking behind it, given that your LTV last report was around 32, 33 percent. Development pipeline of five billion still keeps your LTV below 40 percent, which is in line with, let's say, the sector average. What would your target uh, LTV ratio be, and um, more more on the, the dividend payout reduction? Sure. So, look, I mean, we would like our LTV to be 30. I think in this market. You know, if we look forward over the medium term, I think the companies that that win are the companies with the stronger balance sheet and the better quality assets. Um, I don't think it's the climate to be aggressive. So we're just looking at our dividend payout ratio, at the structure of our company, our large development pipeline, and uh, I think the board wants to be conservative in this market. But you know, we don't want to be too conservative, and we also need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the B shareholders are taking a lot of pain. Uh, one of the questions coming through, um, does the 8.4% estimated yield on the development pli pipeline includes forecast capitalized interest in the base? Yes, that, that, that includes it. That's at 8.4 is what's, what's currently under construction. So it's the roughly 1.7 billion of our pro rata share. That includes capitalized interest at uh, 9, 9.1%. 9 um, and what portion of the 5 billion development pipeline is currently pre let not a significant portion. I think we've had, uh, I think we've got two buildings under construction, but that pipeline will probably be rolled out over about five years. So, you know, as as we get closer to pushing the button, we would expect some some prelets to come through. Um, we're getting a lot of questions around the capitalized interest. Just maybe to refresh the investors' memories, how do you guys look at treating that on the capitalized interest? So, capitalized interest is capitalized. Um, on the land that's currently under development. Um, I see that question coming through there. As it's completed and, it, and uh, we receive practical completion from the contractor, if it is unlit at that stage, then we, we stop capitalizing interest. So then that, uh, that does hurt the earnings. Um, Touchwood, we, uh, we haven't really had much of that. I think we had one building at Lolade which stood vacant for about two months while we negotiated the lease, but uh, we've managed to let all of our speculative buildings before practical completion thus far. Which year do you estimate you would have completed your 10 billion rand disposal? Look, it's, it's probably not going to be next year, but it'll take, you know, I think, look, it's, it's non-core for us. So, you know, we want to get on with it. Um, we would, if we got the right price, we would sell it all tomorrow. But realistically, I think if we could do 2 billion a year, I think that would probably be a good target for us and then recycle that. And with regards to disposals at, uh, let's say, at about NAV, um, could be around 2.8 billion in this financial year. Uh, why do you need a payout a ratio less than one for the bees? We're going to recycle that capital into the development pipeline and then reduce our LTV. Um, those sales, as I mentioned, are still conditional. So cautiously optimistic, but uh, you know, anything could happen in this in this market. And I think we are focused on maintaining balance sheet strength, and then also acutely aware that the bees uh, need to be treated fairly and equitably in this market. Will there be a change to the distribution methodology going forward? We're not expecting that. Um, I mean, the distribution methodology, as we mentioned previously, we would look at a dividend payout ratio, but the distribution calculation in terms of SA REIT best practice, we're not expecting any changes to that. That's really how we look at uh, look at our distributable earnings, and that's that's what we've used to get to the 152 cents for for the Fortress Bees is on a, uh, on a consistent basis to prior years, and that's pretty much in line with SA, the latest SA REIT best practice recommendations. I don't think there's any variance from that, apart from maybe an IFRS 2 charge that we're not quite sure, but that's really immaterial. If you guys do implement a payout ratio reduction, uh, will that imp how will that impact the FFA dividend? No, we are. It's uh, we haven't made any decisions in relation to that. Okay.
Okay, so so if there is a cut, will it impact A or B? Because that's uh, one of the questions. No, we 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 not anywhere near making that decision. I mean, obviously the the A's are preferred, so it would be it would be a challenge to to cut both of those. But uh, as I mentioned, we'll also be engaging with shareholders over the next few weeks, and we haven't made any decisions on that. Share buyback. Uh, you mentioned that sales announcement came out this today. Uh, with regards to shareholder approval, it's slightly missed by that. Would you relook at, let's say, uh, opening it up again to shareholders to possibly re-vote, or we, where does it leave you guys? I think we would, yeah. It was, you know, as, as you would have seen in the sense, 74.99969%. Um, so I think more shareholders than not would like us to be able to buy, buy bees back, um, but we have authority to buy both back. And I, I still think it's, it's relatively attractively priced uh, equity at the moment obviously the bigger discount is is in the fortress bees which i think if you look at it on any metric is uh, very undervalued at the moment and that wouldn't so one of the questions coming through possible buying back of the a shares if you're looking at the cost of funding that would be a possibility sure i think if we've got excess excess cash we could certainly look at buying the a shares back with regards to uh clearwood one of the, in the development pipeline, looking at a higher yield of around 7.8%. Compare that to the full year development yield of around 6.8, 6.9. Just the reason for the, the uptick in the yield. Is that what we could expect uh, given uh, any other developments at Claywood? Yeah, look, that's our best estimate at the moment. You know, based on based on where we see these leases, and obviously one is likely to be pre-let, so you get. Uh, you know, the, the tenants do realise that they're in the pole position in terms of negotiations when you have a, a pre-let. So the pre-let deals tend to be slightly lower yields. Thinking around granting a five-year lease to Bounty Brent, given the financial position of the company. Just a comment on that in terms of how we look at all of our all of our buildings and how we mitigate that risk is uh, all of our buildings are, are generic. So if the tenant doesn't pay. You cancel the lease, you get them out, and you can get the next tenant in. Where specialized buildings or really bespoke distribution centers, I think then you take a lot more credit risk. So, you know, not fast if Bounty Brands uh, falls over, it's Montague Park, it's a very in demand park, we'll just uh, cancel the lease and get someone else in. So, I, I think that's really how we mitigate that risk. Uh, what is the current whack of Fortress, and how does that compare to the yield that can be generated by assets in the pipeline? I think there's two concepts there. So we, we look at our weighted average cost of capital. We we, we have an internal target of 14.5%. So that's what we try and get the guys to to beat in terms of a a return on assets. Um, how does that compare to the yield? It doesn't compare to the yield. Yeah, I need to get a potential rate card that could also support the piece. Could you provide more color on the options available to you around the B units? Yeah, we, we, I, I think there are a myriad of options, and uh, I think we'll we'll discuss it with the board and come back to the market with that. Uh, you you have mentioned that your resilient stake is uh, non-core. Um, would you consider selling the stake and buying back equal number of shares in the A and Bs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our, our equity is relatively well priced attractively priced in terms of uh, where we see you know the resilient share price I mean I guess that's something that we, that we could do but you know, we've also got a we've got a target for resilient in mind and I don't, I don't think it's quite there yet so you know I think there is quite a lot of momentum in that business and I think their their five percent guidance is is positive um, we know that portfolio well so I think there's still there still maybe potentially some upside in that share price okay. uh, regarding the capital allocation, how are you viewing buying back, uh, in this case, FFP, versus rolling out the development pipeline? The FFP is obviously very, very attractive. Um, I think the the challenge that we've got to the pipeline is we have bought the land. We've started rolling out the parks. So we do look at that land, although we could sell it. I think selling three billion rand of, uh, of logistics land in a park in which we have started development and own a few buildings is going to be difficult and we may not realize value there. Um, how we look at it is if you consider the land as a really a sunk cost, we look at the incremental yield 
and uh, you know that incremental yield sits at sort of, I guess, low to mid teens when we look at that. If you just said, well, we basically already bought the land, so that's attractive. And bear in mind that that's an ungeared asset yield versus the B yield, which is um, which is a geared yield. Uh, could you give some guidance as to the dividend withhold ratio you are considering? No, we're not at a, in a position to give uh, give the guidance. I think we're going to, as, as we mentioned, we're going to take a lot of advice, engage with shareholders, and then put it to the board uh, early next year. Um, would you consider expensing all the capitalized interest and reduce the cross-currency interest rate swaps to in line with your gearing in this financial year and cancel the entire dividend for both A and B unit holders? <laughs> it sounds extremely dramatic, so. but you know all of these options we, we we need to explore with the advisors and 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 see where the board is is comfortable and what's really in Fortress's best interest in terms of long term stability and long term confidence in the V units and the value that they hold. Uh, can you please give us a sense of reversions on renewals, especially in the retail sector? Yeah, so retail was uh, slightly positive. Flat to slightly positive in terms of the the new leases that they've signed there. So I think that does, as we mentioned earlier, indicate that the retail is uh, at market related rentals. Um, why not swap resilient and NEPI for Fortress A's to get rid of the structure? Yeah, that's an that's an interesting one. I mean, I think it's you know, I think. Uh, we view the, I mean, it's, that essentially amounts to buying Fortress A's back and, and getting rid of resilience and NEPI. I think we, I think we view the the NEPI shares as core with a lot more potential upside. Why do you believe the B's, the equity base of the company, the A's are also equity capital, just ranking senior. So again, why reduce the B payout ratio if you could even sell as much as 2.8 billion in the financial year potential? Your answer, your answer earlier was not uh, clear enough. Okay. Look, I, I think, I think let's take that offline. I'm, I'm sure, quite yeah. comfortable to discuss this with the shareholders. In, in thing. Okay. Now, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining in for the uh, webcast. Um, that's it from our side. Cheers. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.